All right, uh, as, as I mentioned before lunch, this panel is focused on, actually, I will, I will sit down. Uh, this panel is focused on fake social media movements and social media movements in general and how they connect with policymakers, not because that's the only way to look at it, but as a way to, to as a jumping off point to understand larger societal engagement with these sort of online movements and understanding uh, their purpose, their value, uh, what we can learn from them. We have a fantastic panel. Uh, I, have, I have the long biographies of all these folks that had in, in front of me, and I, I could read them all, uh, but I think we would just be here for all day and night. So I will instead read the first sentence of everyone's biography. Uh, and then I will, I will have a little bit of a framing set up and jump quickly into questions where I will stop talking. Um, so first to my immediate left is Christopher Lewis, who is the president and CEO at Public Knowledge, period. Uh, Chris also was a, is a great, uh, great, a great friend and a former colleague. We, we used to share the same office. Yeah, so uh, yeah. we used to, it was good. <laughs> Uh, next to Chris is Andrea Metwishan, uh, who is a professor uh, in the law school and engineering school at Penn State, the associate dean of innovation at Penn State Law University Park, and the founding faculty director of both the Penn State Pilot Lab, Policy Innovation Lab of Tomorrow, an interdisciplinary technology policy lab, and the Anusia Donesia Sing uh, Song Song Magnolia Lab for gender and economic equality, a technology equity lab and clinic, period. It's a longer first sentence. <laughs> and Michael Livermore is a professor at the University of Virginia law, School of Law and serves as the director of the program in law, communications and environment place, also period. So thank you all for joining us for and I, this is probably a blanket statement, but I will just make it for the panel that I am uh, that I am moderating, which is thank you for joining us for a panel that probably felt very amorphous when you got the email, <laughs> and hopefully we'll we'll open up some very interesting lines of discussion. So as I alluded to earlier, I think that one of the things that I want to try and tease out in this panel is a kind of two part question. Right, so we're using mass public comments as an example of sort of broader internet fakeness issues, right? There are all sorts of social media movements online, all sorts of groups online, um, and they can be hard to think about as an amorphous group. And so thinking about them in the context of specific advocacy is a way to think about them, but certainly not the only way. And I don't think that this conversation will be uh, strictly boxed in by that, but instead we're using it as an anchor. And so if you are thinking about these groups, I think there are at least two big questions that you need to struggle with. Um, the first is understanding which ones are real and which ones are fake. Um, and as a spectrum, right, it is easy to imagine the ends of that spectrum, right? There is, there is the uh, citizen who is deeply informed, read up on the issues and files uh, by their own pen a 20-page comment with citations tied to facts and law. Uh, this is a person who you know, probably exists in the world and their comment is, their, their opinions are probably easy to categorize as real, right? It's a real person who's done real research and really engaged. On the other side of the spectrum, you have a robot who has uh, procedurally generated a name and a set of comments that are completely disconnected from the issue or the question or anything else. Uh, this is clearly fake and probably in many ways can be dismissed. But when you're in the middle, you have, I think a little bit of complexity, right? You are in a place where there are organizations that will set up a form that will allow a commenter to enter their name and use the, the text provided by the organization uh, to serve as their comment. There are organizations that do that, but allow users to edit the comment before it goes in. Um, there are organizations that will just 
based on their email list, send a bunch of comments in on behalf of the people on that email list. Uh, there are organizations where, you know, they'll pay to advertise and reach out to people who had no existing connection to that organization. All of these are kind of comments from a person with some kind of connection to something. And so understanding what we're thinking about, what is real and fake on this spectrum, it can get a little bit complicated and it brings a little bit of nuance. And these kinds of, of labeling issues are again, kind of examples of the broader dynamics that consumers face on the internet, right? Anyone faces on the internet when they're trying to understand a mass online phenomenon. So first you have the sort of categorization questions um, of sort of, is this real, is this fake, is this something in the middle? How do I care? Why do I care what's going on? And then the second question is, you know, if you are an agency trying to understand all this incoming information, what does it mean to assess and consider this information? Right? What is, what do you think you're trying to get from all of these public comments? Right? What do you, what do you imagine the information you're trying to get? What, is the, what does the system suspect you are trying to do with this information? And this becomes especially important as these, especially as agencies, but even you know, companies who are doing mass sentiment analysis, any of these, any of these um, efforts to take large amounts of information and synthesize and distill it. The question is, well, like, what are you trying to synthesize it for? Or what, do you, what is the purpose of your summary? How are people going to use it? And these questions are also very much tied up with larger questions around, you know, computer security risk and trustworthiness online generally, and like how you think about the purpose of the systems that you are building. So this is like a very uh, broad and blue sky framing framing setup. I want to have a bunch of questions I want to ask the panelists uh, to take and to take wherever they see fit. We'll also have questions from you all in the end. But the first question I have for you is, is kind of with the very premise, right? Are these distinctions that I'm describing even meaningful, right? Is it, is it actually hard to determine which internet content, which comments, which anything else is real or fake? Or am I just creating a problem that doesn't actually exist when you look at it more directly? And should, Anyone, should decision makers, should agencies, should someone on the internet be spending any time trying to categorize this? Is this a worthwhile enterprise at all? Um, as with all these questions, I will just, I'll open them to the floor and I invite anyone to jump in who has thoughts. Uh, sure, uh, from one Michael to the next. Um, <laughs> so uh, it might make sense to take a step back, given that we have a kind of a crowd here that's kind of maybe we'll have different understanding of the administrative process. And it's like, what is the role of these public comments anyway? What are we talking about? So just generally what we're talking about here is, you know, under, in the US broadly, administrative agencies have a very uh, important role in making lots of profound decisions, public policy decisions, including things like how much are we gonna control greenhouse gas emissions and how are we gonna regulate internet service providers? The way they exercise that control, the, the policy making function is um, under statutes where they're delegated authority. One of the most relevant statutes for this process is called the Administrative Procedure Act, which sets up a way for agencies to exercise their authority through something called notice and comment rulemaking. So the notice and comment rulemaking process has evolved to include a, a process whereby agencies solicit public comments from the, um, you know, from anybody who wants to send in these public comments. And agencies are actually obligated under law to consider the, what the comments say. Okay, so that's the process. And over the years, what happened is you had a fairly insider process, say in the 70s, where only a handful of interest groups would, um, would participate. And gradually that evolved into a really broad mass process where hundreds of thousands and even millions of people participate in notice and comment rulemaking. And many of you may have actually seen emails like this where, some, where an organization that you're part of sends you, maybe even public knowledge, sends you an email and says, look, there's a rulemaking process, it's very important, you know, please comment, uh, make your voice heard kind of thing. Okay, so, so that's just a little bit of background on what we're talking about. 
uh, this question of fake comments came up in the after the uh, FCC's major rulemakings on net neutrality. So the Federal Communications Commission had several rulemakings that touched on the question of internet governance. And in that process, the agency received many millions of comments and it became clear that some of those comments, let's just say were a little strange, right? I don't wanna say fake because that's a loaded word here, right? But they were odd. And it, uh, what ultimately turned out to be the case is that a large number of them were computer generated, um, you know, like, like kind of like the stereotypical guy in the basement in Queens sent in like a million comments. And not only were they bot generated, but many of them had uh, essentially he had gone through the phone book and put random people's names on the comments. Okay, so as a, as a consequence of that FCC rulemaking, there's been lots of uh, concern on this in, in DC, and there's been concerns in other rulemakings. There was an SEC rulemaking that had some misattributed comments, and so Congress has paid some attention. And then uh, the Administrative Conference of the United States, which is this kind of entity that worries about these things, uh, convened a, a group of experts on it to, to do a report, and that's I worked on that report. So I'll just say a couple of kind of, now to with those framing remarks, a couple of points on the question. So for, for that report, we actually disaggregated the issue into three uh, categories. So one is the bot generated comments. So that presents one set of issues that's worth kind of thinking about separately. Another uh, category is misattributed comments, which could be bot comments, but don't need to be. I could actually misattribute comments uh, to you if I wanted to, right? Any individual could do that um, without computer help. And then finally, there's mass comments, where mass comments are, it could be campaigns, they could be form letters, they could be solicitations. There's, there's lots of different things that those could be, but what characterizes them is that there's a lot of them. And you can imagine, you know, these are, you know, sets that could potentially overlap. And, um, and I think just to kind of, again, kind of stick with the question, if we're thinking all of these are fake in some general sense, but it's very useful to consider these distinct categories because they present different challenges, different problems, and we might want to think about them very differently. So the, the final maybe just opening remark that I'll make on this is that one of the things that we what struck us during this process was that all of these new kinds of comments really provided us an opportunity in a way, which I think is broadly true with the whole notion of fakeness, of thinking about like, what is the thing that you care about, right? Like, why do we have this public comment process? What's, what's the utility function here? And that might help us to consider how to deal with these new, um, these new challenges. And so um, what, I'll just give you my thoughts on that uh, again, briefly. So the public comment process is usually thought of um, by experts, insiders in the world of administrative law, folks at agencies, courts for the most part, as a technocratic process. The goal of the public comment process is to get information that agencies can use to improve their rulemaking. That's like the paradigmatic thing. And that's often contrasted with the idea of a, a broad vote. So courts say like the public comment process is not a vote. You can go like find courts to, that will say that. Um, and people in administrative agencies say that all the time. If you ask them, oh, what do you do with mass comments? They will often say, oh, we ignore them. And they're just kind of like with a straight face. Um, and so that would be kind of one way of thinking about this stuff. And if that's true, it gives us like a different way of thinking about mass comments or bot comments or even misattributed comments. Like maybe they're not such a big deal because it's just about the information content. And you know, whether it's from a computer or not, like who cares? A mass comment can just be deduped. That's no big deal. Um, even a misattributed comment is probably not a big deal most of the time. On the other hand, you know, you might think that the public comment process is about getting a different kind of information, which is political information. What do people in the community actually think about this? And if agencies sp supposed to or does care about that, then you will think very differently about bot generated comments because then it's creating a misimpression within the agency about support one way or the other. So that's problematic from an information perspective. Um, another way that's very uncommon, but I don't think is a bad way necessarily to think about the public comment process is that it's a form of participation. It's a form of exercising political power for people in the community, uh, for the, you know, broadly for, for Americans. And if, if that's true, then these really raise even more serious problems, right? Because um, you don't want a bot exercising political power, right? You don't want someone exercising political power illicitly under their name, right? Uh, that's a big problem. Uh, at the same time, the agency's deduping public comments, mass comments, is a huge problem if what if they're supposed to be taking into consideration, um, you know, everyone gets a voice and they ought to be weighed. And so, um, so I think what's interesting about the, these kind of fake comments 
is that they require us to think deeply about what the process is for on some questions that frankly we've fudged for the last 50 years. And, um, and then once, if we can get that at least somewhat clear in our minds, it can give us a framework for thinking about how to address these different challenges. You want to go? All right. Um, that was really good. Uh, you actually covered some of what I, what I wanted to talk about. Um, so, all right. So given the background that Michael just gave, uh, let me suggest an answer uh, to the options that you offered. Uh, uh, so since I don't have to explain them. Uh, so our experience of public knowledge uh, comes from communi communications and technology law. So largely work at the, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, the Federal Trade Commission, the Copyright Office, uh, and the Congress. And, and I, I like the way you, you set up the, the, the options of looking at it, Michael, because I believe that the system was set up for a reason, that we have agencies and regulatory bodies uh, there with delegated authority uh, to do the work that Congress can't do. Uh, at least in, in technology policy, we really feel that way about it, that there is a level of expertise that is needed um, to get policy right, that Congress does not have the time uh, or the expertise to, to dive into. Um, and so there's a real purpose, to use your word, Michael, um, uh, in having agencies with narrow authority, but deep power. Um, and, and I think the Federal Communications Commission is a great example uh, and the net neutrality proceeding that really kicked off uh, these concerns um, is, is a good example as well. I, I would suggest that um, the, the problem with the comments in the net neutrality proceeding were only problematic from a political perspective um, because uh, the agency's authority is limited by statute to specific decisions uh, and, and, and only so many options within those decisions. They are only allowed to, under the, if you take net neutrality, for example, they are only allowed to create rules that uh, uh, deal with certain types of entities. Uh, They're only allowed to deal with rules that deal with certain concerns about those entities, say non-discrimination, which is uh, at the core of, of the net neutrality rules. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And so when Congress says, this is what you're allowed to work on, but you're the experts, figure it out. Uh, a comment process is meant to help them be as smart as they can uh, as the experts. Um, and so, um, you know, fake comments, if they can be deduped, uh, if comments that appropriate um, uh, people's names uh, fraudulently uh, can be weeded out. I think by and large, you're getting what you want out of the process. That, that's the argument I would make. Um, uh, and because the rest of the comments are from folks who are experts, be it my experts of public knowledge or folks from industry who disagree with us, uh, but they can lay down the legal and technical arguments that empower the agency to do its job and make a decision one way or the other. Um, I, uh, I'm really interested in ways to hold uh, folks accountable for how they use tools um, to, to generate mass bot uh, comments or you know, uh, misappropriated comments um, because it will make the agency uh, uh, able to do its job better. Uh, but in the end, uh, Policymakers, especially people in Congress, they do often just put their finger up in the air and, and say, this is what I think is the right thing to do based on what I'm hearing from my constituents. And so that information about high volumes of comments is instructive to them as the oversight body for the expert agencies. So that if they don't like uh, a decision that the agency made, they can and are empowered to under the constitution to make changes uh, and supersede the expert agency uh, based on political reasoning. The agency is not really supposed to be doing that. Uh, the courts, when, when these cases inevitably get reviewed by the courts and challenged, it's based on the record that the agency had in front of them and how they justify using that record for the decision that they made. And so there's a system and a role that makes sense here for the purpose of the agency, the purpose of the courts, and the political purpose of the Congress that is accountable to you, the public. Um, 
So, so that's just a thinking about agency. I think it gets far messier when you talk about uh, comments in other contexts, because uh, when you're in, and, and Andrew, I know you studied this more than me, uh, when you get into context uh, about people who are lying about uh, uh, themselves on the internet broadly, um, or in situations that are far more important to the functioning of, uh, of society, uh, that's where the ability to, you know, to have real accountability for uh, folks who create fake things is going to be more important than at an agency where they can weed them out or where they can ignore them. Uh, so to start with answering the question, I think these distinctions are very important for many reasons. But before I go into that, I must include the obligatory disclaimer. Anything I say here today comes from me and my capacity as a law professor and should not be deemed to be attributable to any agency that I'm appointed to or work with. This is just me being me, law professor me. Okay, so um, I'd like to offer uh, a little bit of a framing, taking a step back. This is primarily a set of comments derived from my Cardozo Law Review article with my co-author, uh, computer scientist Miranda Mowbray from the UK. Um, and also um, the arguments will be a bit of a preview of uh, the article that I'm finishing now called Super Spreaders. Um, so uh, I'd like to start with um, offering perhaps an articulation of some of the socio-technical uh, ways that we might frame the uh, experiences of harm that we're uh, seeing in internet contexts and in technology contexts broadly. So what my co-author and I argue in fake is that uh, you might be able to categorize all of the technology harms that we currently see today essentially into four buckets. Um, the first is manipulation of content and authenticity. The second is impersonation. The third is sequestration, meaning algorithms nudging us into dark corners that we aren't necessarily sure of what other people are experiencing. And the final one is toxicity. So that would be things like brigading or um, uh, DDoS attacks, et cetera. So why does this matter? Well, these experiences are the socio-technical descriptions, but they're not necessarily mapping cleanly onto our existing legal categories of redress or the paradigms that judges are used to working with. So what um, a challenging undertaking, but a worthy one, I think, is, is to try to map these two experienced realities, one socio-technical and one legal, into a step toward a workable framework, in particular, that is First Amendment sensitive, um, so that we can unpack what's actually new here, and where do we need legal tweaks, and where do we need to um, perhaps merely re-engage with traditional frameworks in order to um, apply them in ways that assist with remedying some of these four problems of MIST that I just listed. It, it, the acronym is MIST, and we have a whole spider theme in the article, but I'll just skip over that. <laughs> um, so uh, what's new? Two things, I think, are new here. The first is that the ability of technology to amplify and merge the current always on reality with um, the in the background machine learning enabled databases of um, you know, digital dossiers on people or uh, the sets of assumptions that are made about people, whether they be correct or incorrect, are working in tandem to allow for the creation of a circumstance that enables an internet long con, as we call it, meaning that people are able to have a foot in the door at time one and to, as my hacker friends would say, laterally move into another point of exploitation at time two. And the way that these databases and algorithms talk to each other enable this kind of a reality, which is slightly different in its amplification and speed from what we had before, allowing for new kinds or at least morphed kinds of con artistry and fraud. The second is borrowed from uh, the little cited, but I think very interesting half of the uh, Eisenhower quote about the military industrial complex. The second part of that quote that uh, I frankly didn't know existed until I started doing this research 
was that Eisenhower cautioned about the emergence of a scientific technical elite with its own set of interests that could do damage to our society. And this admonition um, uh, is consonant with some of the dynamics, again, from the world of information security, which is my primary domain. Um, shout out to the hacker peeps, I guess, um, um, it is the emergence of um, the combination of high-end advertising techniques with high-end uh, techniques from military psychological operations. There's a revolving door of personnel between some of um, the more clandestine organizations into certain types of commercial enterprises that engage in uh, very tailored content creation uh, engagement, both with respect to selling products, but also with respect to changing political opinions. And so we termed this dynamic the PSYOP industrial complex. And we go through some of the history of PSYOP and we go through some of the uh, perhaps uncomfortable convergence even from the very beginning of um, the use of uh, the skills of advertising to help um, change political hearts and minds and how that has evolved uh, over time. So those are the two dynamics that are different. So we have the missed harms, we have these two dynamics that are different. And what we offer is a framework that, and there's a chart if you like, boxes with things written in them. Uh, there's a chart that um, offers basically a uh, three pronged, does a chart have prongs? Well, there's a cube but that doesn't really have prongs either. Anyway, there's a chart that has three types of elements in it. So the approach is called the NICE evaluation. Uh, so N stands for the nature of the fakery. And here we reached into the philosophy of trust what is it that philosophers of trust have thought about in terms of uh, the things that make people and uh, products trustworthy, and also the philosophy of lying? What are the categories of lying? And so depending on the category of lying, you have a potentially different set of legal consequences that I'm happy to go into, but for the sake of moving things along, I'll stop there for now. The second piece of this three-pronged approach is looking to the intent of the faker. And this is central to the way that the First Amendment analyzes these issues. Um, and intent is something that courts have been comfortable deducing generally. And so there we have uh, the ability of courts to kind of up their game to engage with these issues in ways that are understandable and can be brought along um, as a sort of uh, scaffolding from time A to time B. And then the final piece in this framework looks to the sensitivity of the context. There will be certain contexts where the same type of fakery will cause significantly different quality of harm. And so the punchline of our article is that you look to these three variables, the nature of the fakery, the intent of the faker, and the context sensitivity in order to map whether we should most appropriately have a criminal intervention, a civil intervention, a regulatory intervention, and what kinds of case law consequences can spring from this. So I'll, I'll stop there for, for now. Thank you. Um, Chris, I wanna follow up with you first. Yeah. Public knowledge is an interesting organization because it, it's in this context, especially because it, it both files substantive comments, right? Pages and pages and pages. Um, and also sometimes itself and sometimes in coalition works with organizations that are pulling together mass comments. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious how you think about the different purpose of the, I mean, you spend a lot of effort, I and mean, the advocacy world spends a lot of effort on both of these things. Yeah. So what is the reason for doing them? And I'm also curious in the, and like, how should, how do you think, how do you think agencies think about them? How should they think about them? Especially in the context where you mentioned, you know, maybe it makes sense to dedupe 
mass comments, right? If it makes sense to dedupe mass comments, why have them in the first place? Right. Um, okay. Well, I'll start with the, the last question. It, it makes sense to dedupe them um, and count how many people uh, provided mass comments because uh, agencies are small. They don't have a lot of staff. Uh, if you can find systems to dedupe and deliver a message and say this many people delivered the same message over and over again. Okay, message delivered, and we understand the volume and the political context, or uh, political importance of that volume, uh, both at the oversight level of Congress and at the agency, if they even want to factor that in, which really I would say they shouldn't be, um, but it's there. Um, so for, for efficiency sake alone, I think that's important. Um, you know, the, I, yeah, I subscribe to the category, obviously, that Michael was setting up, that there's a political importance um, to, uh, and, and a free speech importance and a participatory importance to allowing anyone in the public to comment into these spaces. And, and we encourage it for the political reasons. Um, so when we work in coalition, uh, you know, the, the, the record setting comments, the net neutrality proceeding, uh, a lot of them came from our coalition. Uh, and uh, and it demonstrated to Congress that because they had not acted for years and had left the decision to the agency, uh, that uh, it showed them that there's great interest in these protections uh, from our perspective, uh, and that uh, and they had an interest in making sure that any um, weakening or wavering of the agency on uh, net neutrality protections um, should be looked at seriously by the Congress. Um, and lo and behold, after the 2015 net neutrality rules, that, which we were in favor of, they were repealed by the next FCC, by the next administration. So there was a wavering in the agency based on political elections. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, the fact that millions of people weighed in showed folks that it was important. I think it had a factor, uh, it was a factor in uh, when uh, the, uh, the Senate looked at overturning the repeal of net neutrality, why you saw a bipartisan vote to uh, overturn that decision. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get one in the House. So the politics matter. The expertise of the agency matters too. Um, uh, because too often we see uh, uh, the policymakers that have delegated authority in Congress uh, not have the time or the capability to really, uh, you know, get into technology at the level of an engineer. You know, I'm sure get into, uh, you know, uh, uh, environmental issues at the level of an environmental expert. And, um, and yes, it, it means that there are folks in the advocacy community like public knowledge who develop an expertise to support uh, the rulemaking processes at the agency level, but I think that's important on behalf of the public to have that there to match the political um, uh, use of comments. Um, and and I, I like that the fact that uh, the agency and the courts that review their decisions are set up to deal with the expertise part and Congress is set up to deal with the political part. I think that's intentional. And when those bleed, I think you get less quality in your in your policy making. Andrea, I'd like to ask you what I'm thinking of in my head is the sort of Mike Masnick nerd harder question, which is you know, you've set up you set up two different frameworks, right? The sort of thinking about these types of comments either in the agency context or in, in the broader internet context of the sort of the mist uh, the mist framework or the nice framework, the sort of nature intent context framework. Um, you know, Michael set up this sort of information gathering, participation, political info. When faced with a lot of information, many people have an instinct to kind of reach for a robot to help, regardless of whether or not that robot is going to be helpful. How do you think about, you know, using any one of those frameworks or, or another one that makes sense to you, which of this stuff lends itself to, to leaning on automation or AI or, you know, robot as a category of assistant, and which of it is, is sort of foolish to think that this is something that just can be fixed with the right algorithm or the right software assistance. Mm -hmm. 
so I think technologically speaking, we're dealing with a moving target in all cases, but we don't live in the world yet, at least, where uh, you can get um, perfect moderation with algorithms. It, you know, it just, it's no substitute for the more powerful processing power if we want to um, sort of objectify the human being as a machine, which, you know, we should be careful with that. Um, it, the human brain is still more powerful than any computer that people have invented to this point. Um, and it's no substitute for understanding the nuances uh, of cultural context um, to have uh, an algorithm programmed by a small team who undoubtedly have done a good job within their experience. Um, but um, the world is a complicated place. Um, so I think this gets to asking questions about which kinds of um, information inputs and people, air quotes, that we meet on the internet in the sometimes not so friendly neighborhood of the internet, uh, which are we deeming to be trusted, meaning that we are relying on them, whether we should or not, and which we deem trustworthy, which in the way that the uh, philosophers who have looked at this view as an analysis of the skill set of a person in context. So when we're assessing expertise, we're assessing whether someone is worthy of our trust. It is both a combination of looking at the individual, but also the particular context that the individual is operating in. And I think that's uh, reasonably true for looking at technological interventions as well. It, it may, but is that, is that something that can be done technologically or is that something that is, that is such a human experience that to try and automate it at scale? There are certain things that can be automated at which scale. Are, which are the thing, like when you think about that landscape. So here's an example. There are, um, definitely circumstances where um, the owner slash operator of a system has superior knowledge about, say, the country of origin of a person who is posting something on the internet. It may not be accurate 100% of the time because the person may be using Tor, there may be 20 proxies, right? But there is a baseline of information that the person operating the system has that an average user subsequently looking at that posted information does not necessarily have. And that is um, an example, hypothetically, of the sort of automated labeling that in theory could be created um, or in some cases does already exist. I have, I have follow-up questions for that, but I want to jump to Michael first. Um, and that is, you, you laid out this framework, this sort of roles that agencies view comments in, the information gathering, the participation, the political information. Chris commented on how he thinks that, that it is true that they, they balance all of those things, maybe has a preference for away from the political and towards the more substantive areas. What is your sense of how agencies are balancing those things? And if you want to editorialize how they should balance those things, but also then finally, if there's a role for technology that is separate in those categories, or there's some grand unified vision of, te of technological support. Great. So, so there's, yeah, there's a couple of dimensions. Like a multi-part so lawyer question. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> So there's, um, there's three things. There's what agencies do, there's what agencies say they do, <laughs> and then there's what agencies should do maybe. And then, yeah, so then there's the interesting technology, technology question. So uh, as part of this report for, for ACAS, uh, we talked to a lot of agency officials and they tended to say, um, oh, we, we take an entirely expert view. Like all we're doing is looking for substance. That's the only thing that matters to us. Um, and so mass comments, we ignore, um, or we, we look at the one that's representative. And if there's anything of substance, we take it into account, but otherwise it doesn't matter how many times something uh, we receive, we receive something. We're not worried about bot comments because uh, they're mostly kind of uh, unsophisticated. And if we, who knows, if a bot gave us a good comment that was substantively useful, we would take it into consideration. We don't care. That's kind of the idea. Um, 
uh, there's two parts to that. So one um, is it's relevant what level of the agency we were talking to. So when we were interviewing folks, we were mostly talking to career civil servants uh, who have been in agencies for many years. And, um, you know, and so their bosses are the political appointees. These are the career civil servants. And so if we think about what legitimates someone like that in their environment, it's expertise. It's a recourse to this notion that they're in neutral experts who are just providing a, you know, kind of a impartial perspective. And so it's very uh, sensible for them to then make a kind of claim that all they're interested in is this substantive neutral information, right? So it's very much uh, fitting with their role. When you talk to people or you get feedback from people who are kind of higher up, more kind of political appointees, more on the level of like an administrator or, or a commissioner, if we're talking about the FCC um, or an associate administrator at another agency like the Environmental Protection Agency, they're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course we care about the number of comments that we receive, right? Like that's just part of our job. Um, we, and they would never say publicly that they don't take that into consideration because that would be like a crazy thing for them to say like, oh, yeah, we just we don't care how many people like or don't like what we do. Like they, they don't say stuff like that. They're certainly not going to say that on the Hill. Um, and so, so yeah, so they would, of course, say uh, we take the weight of, of opinion very seriously. It's part of what we care about. We want to do things that are good for the American public. And, and what they would do is they would kind of merge that. They would say, look, when we're doing our job correctly, it should work both ways. Like what we decide to do and applying our expertise will be what is politically popular because people want us to do smart things. Right? So that would be kind of how they um, merge that together. There's another piece of this, which is uh, the role of courts. So, um, as I said, agencies are legally obligated to consider um, the comments that they receive. And courts have articulated what that means over time. So one of the things um, that they've articulated is it's pretty clear, although not maybe crystal clear, but it's fairly clear that agencies can take the balance of opinion into account. They're not legally barred from that. Some people have kind of claimed something like that in the neighborhood of that, but that's wrong. Like if an agency were to say, look, we got a lot of negative comments, on this rulemaking, we didn't get very many positive comments. And so that, that's, gonna, that's, that's caused us to rethink a lot and make some changes. That's going to be a, an acceptable answer. Agencies can say something like that. Um, showing that an agency made a change in response to like lots of comments is not going to like make, undermine the legitimacy of an agency decision. Um, that having been said, what courts uh, generally do is they focus on substance, the substance of comments. And, they will, and the courts will say agencies are not ob obligated to take the balance of opinion into account, right? So you can't go to court and say, look, there were more negative opinions about this than there were positive opinions. That doesn't get you anywhere, right, with the court. Um, the courts are like, we don't care. And so with the, the way that like litigation will work is you go into the court and you say, we presented this substantive argument to the agency uh, and they didn't respond to it appropriately. They didn't make, you know, uh, changes that would be uh, that would be appropriate or they didn't explain why they didn't make those changes. And so given that that's what courts are looking for, you know, it's very sensible for agencies to focus on those kinds of comments. So what agencies tend to actually do, I would say in practice, putting aside their um, whatever they say, is they focus on the comments of the actors that they think might sue them, <laughs> right? They have the, have the resources to, to take those comments and then turn them into litigation. And then what they, the way they take them into consideration is they might take uh, if there's something that's like that they find useful into, into account, they will do that. But for the most part, what they want to do is make any changes that they need to, plus make any responses they need to in order to essentially bulletproof their rule from litigation challenge, right? They know what they want to do, right? Um, and it's just a mad, for the most part, maybe some tweaks aside. And then um, what they're mostly trying to do is make sure that that survives a judicial challenge. So there's a little way in which the way we talk about the public comment process is this like neutral thing where we collect information, kubaya, is not necessarily, you know, doesn't necessarily fit with the reality, which is it's much more about interest group clash and litigation and, and so on. That, that's, that's also the reality. Um, and then, okay, so that's kind of what agencies say what agencies do, and then agencies are thinking about Congress. But the reality is just, you know, one other thing that I'll just kind of put on the table, this moves us into what agencies maybe should do. We have to be very careful about how we think about the public comment process, because even putting aside malattributed or misattributed, um, bot generated and questions around the validity of mass comments, putting those, cabining those for a moment, we still have to real recognize that the folks who comment in a rulemaking are totally non-representative. Right. They don't, it's, it's just a, it's not a random group of people. I was going to say random. That's exactly what it's not. It's the opposite <laughs> of that. It's totally selected. And so 
Um, and so we have to think about how do we feel about that? That doesn't necessarily mean that we ignore them. Um, and so one way we might analogize it is, you know, there's, there's juries, right? And some people have talked about using juries in the rulemaking process, kind of select a small number of people. Of course, jury members are, ran, are somewhat randomly selected, but they're far, far from representative. Um, you can have polls, right? Where pollsters really try to get a, a representative sample. If you really, what you want to do is tie your rulemaking to public opinion or what people thought actually out in the world, you would probably do polling would be your best way of getting at that information it wouldn't be through a public comment process. But you can also analogize this to voting and voting, of course, which we think of as very democratically legitimating is based on a totally non representative sample, like the people who vote in elections are very, very different from a random selection of people. Um, they have more money. Uh, their age is non-representative. There's all kinds of ways that they differ from the, the public at large. And so, you know, so that's a reality. And we might think that the public comment process could be legitimated on kind of similar grounds. It's this participatory ground. The idea isn't that what we really want to do is tie the rulemaking to like, say, majoritarian preferences or something like that. What we want to do is create an opportunity for people who want to be politically engaged to be politically engaged in a way that they actually exercise power, exercise power over the government. And if that's our goal, then actually the non-representativeness of the participators isn't necessarily a problem, but then the agency can't do kind of what it currently does, which is essentially for, with respect to many things, ignore the number of people who are participating, ignore what most people have to say. Um, so I think that it's agencies are in a real bad and have been for a long time, um, again, the the, the fake stuff, right, that we've seen in the last few years, the different kinds of fake comments, um, really only just you know, exacerbate and then focus attention on this really longstanding tension in the administrative process. So I guess what my, oh, one other thing that I'll just kind of put on the table too, um, that's an important nuance. There's lots of different kinds of rulemaking. <laughs> we've been talking about the FCC net neutrality rulemaking, which like John Oliver talked about on television and Burger King did a commercial about it. I don't know if you guys remember that, but there's literally a commercial on television <laughs> uh, for like hamburgers and you know net neutrality together. I don't know if public knowledge had anything to do with that. Maybe um, <laughs> it's not a thing. <laughs> but um, but in any case, uh, that was uh, you know that was super high profile. And I mentioned you know greenhouse gas emissions and so on. But like there's only a handful of those rules every once in a while, not even every year. And so, you know, most rules, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, or if not thousands of rulemakings, even major rulemakings with millions of dollars or, you know, many millions of dollars of consequences every year. And they're very technical. They're not the kind of thing that anyone would get, in, you know, really all that interested in. And um, so we just have to recognize that the kind of process and the kind of concerns that we bring to bear for like the mega rulemakings, the really important stuff are very different than the kinds of concerns that we're going to have on you know, FCC, even within the FCC, tweaking the permitting requirements around this or that, or EPA you know, having a, a technical rule having to do with like a, tech, you know, a particular technology for water pollution control. Important, these are all important things, um, but they're not the stuff of John Oliver or Burger King commercials. And um, you know, so the, the things that we're worried about are quite different. So with the respect to the should question, I do think that we really need to tailor uh, our understanding of what agencies should be doing, the mix of politics and technocratic, um, you know, understandings, the reality of partisanship in the administrative process, which is like pretty under theorized for administrative law people who tend to ignore that, you know, every few years, you know, the agency just whoop, switch to like another side and they switch positions. And that's clearly not a technocratic, you know, just a technocratic thing. Um, and so thinking a little bit more deeply about the role of partisanship, not just politics, but specifically partisanship in the administrative process, um, I think is also kind of on the table. And um, so anyway, that's, you know, th those are just more like, it's not like what they should do, but what they should be thinking about when they decide what they should do. Andrew, I wonder, one way to, I think one way to understand your, your most recent paper is to attempt to bring procedures thinking information from the information security world into this world of like understanding what is real and fake on the internet. And so I wonder how prepared are policymakers writ large, right? Policymakers in agencies or in government or however broadly you want to define that. Um, how prepared are they to bring those frameworks in? 
And maybe more importantly, how does the world look different as those players in the space or you know, advocates or anyone else begin to incorporate these kinds of understandings into how they see the internet and, and the internet intersecting with their world? So um, let me connect that with another bit of philosophy. Um, and uh, there are folks uh, in uh, other fields that have given these kinds of questions uh, a lot of thought in admittedly slightly different contexts. But I think that by learning from the work that's already been done in other fields, we sometimes can see um, ways of looking at our own field uh, anew. Um, so let me connect uh, some useful frameworks um, that are uh, created by the philosophers Helen Longineau and Ian Hacking, and uh, my version is in the spirit of, I, I'm trying not to, to do violence to their thinking, but uh, I'm only willing to say in the spirit of, not that I'm um, qualified to be applying their, their frameworks directly, um, but the spirit of the insights of um, those two philosophers points us to potentially a way to merge some of the core First Amendment concerns that do impact both private sector and the public sector um, with uh, uh, these questions of fakery. So in particular, there is a debate and discussion in the philosophy literature about how to develop um, cultures of criticism that lead us to um, better places. So as we all know, philosophers have been debating the definition of truth for a very long time, for thousands of years. So uh, I really appreciated the great framing comments that we had at the beginning of uh, this conversation. So what can we do with that in light of that reality of thought? Well, we can ask ourselves of how do we nevertheless create shared baselines, shared baselines of understanding. And uh, there are at least four ways that we could identify shared baselines um, that show up in society and court discussions, et cetera. So the first is hierarchy. We have certain designated uh, points of uh, determining certain questions decisively. What am I talking about? Um, NIST. NIST sets standards. NIST has NIST cheese and NIST chocolate. It's not uh, asserting that that is the best cheese or the best chocolate, it's just a baseline. And so you can assess your cheese or your chocolate based on how much it deviates from the NIST standard. So that's hierarchy. The second, and this is the acronym HELP, H-E-L-P. The second is expertise. So expertise, we have uh, the question of how do we determine expertise? Generally, it's something, some combination of years of uh, work in a particular field, credentialing, et cetera. Um, we decide how we uh, uh, generate that category, but that's something that certainly we see in courts and, and the way that people defer to each other in conversation. The third category, which I find the most engaging and interesting is a set of legacy processes. And when I'm talking about legacy processes here, I'm thinking about Punxsutawney Phil. Everyone recognizes a weird form of legitimacy of Punxsutawney Phil. It's not clear that we trust Phil's prognostication abilities on the weather, but it is a community building experience and people love that groundhog. They love him. There's a whole festival around him. Anyway, I, I digress. So that is a legacy thing that it's kind of a shared joke that we're all part of, but yet we're not going to let Phil the groundhog give us financial advice necessarily either. And <laughs> Phil's track record of prediction is I think worse than 50% correct on whether spring's coming. And then the final P is process. And so here I'm thinking about things like civil procedure, criminal procedure, the way that we establish trustworthiness of systems by um, assigning beforehand the flow of the information and the way that things will work. So those four categories of baselines can help us potentially create hooks of stability in an otherwise tumultuous reality, potentially. 
and also merge with the First Amendment, um, various strands of First Amendment doctrine. Part of what makes this whole set of questions so interesting for me and so complicated in my mind is that you're dealing with five to 10 different strands of First Amendment uh, mm -hmm. uh, cases here. Um, and um, so you're dealing with, uh, for example, you know, Alvarez's discussion about um, the fact that false speech um, should uh, primarily be regulating context leading to fraud, lying to public officials, perjury, impersonation, defamation, but they're gonna be, the court is gonna be hesitant to um, be accepting of other contexts. Citizens United, even that case, which uh, certainly reasonable people will disagree about uh, the consequences of it. Uh, nevertheless, that case upheld a disclosure-based requirement. So that gives us an insight into some of the approaches that could work in these contexts. Ward v. Rock Against Racism dealt with amplification requirements. That line of cases is directly applicable to some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and perhaps most creatively, uh, low VSEC deals with personalization requirements. And that's a path that we haven't necessarily engaged with uh, yet. Uh, and then there's a second bundle of moderation issues uh, from New York Times v. Sullivan and ACLU uh, v. Reno. Um, and that's coming attractions in my next article. Thank you. Uh, I have lots of more questions, but I think we're at a, a point where I want to invite questions for the audience. I will say that a, uh, a tick that I, I developed when I was in Washington is whenever I open the floor to questions, I have to remind people that questions end with a question mark. Uh, not a period. Uh, but with that caveat, uh, please feel free uh, to come on up. Uh, we've got two mics here, and I welcome questions. Don't be shy. It's always great to be the first person. All right. Hi, everyone. I guess I'll just make the joke over and over and over. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as some of you know, um, I run an organization that occasionally participates in these kinds of public comments. Um, I do want to say, like, this happened to me. Another organization, FFK, we were working on and flooded the copyright office with a bot, basically, like, click the button, random person, you get to comment on this very specific thing. It was terrible. It, was embarrassing and, I, and it, didn't, it didn't feel right, right? It was not what the copyright office was looking for and it was inappropriate. Um, so I didn't want to just kind of preface that I have like a strong opinion on this um, before I, I ask my question. Thank you all so much. Um, so one of the things that I, I think about a lot is this comment from the author, Pia Tolentino, um, where she says that one of the issues with like internet activism is that it collapses the difference between saying something and doing something. And so what I wonder with some of these public comments is whether or not you feel that you know, because there is little space beyond social media to kind of comment on things in a technocratic or institutional way, and because you know, state comment um, systems are, are pretty difficult to use if you often have to show up or they're kind of ignored or very, very difficult to weigh in on local topics or people don't actually want to adjust the time to go for camp in up the time, go into these. So it, it, it's easier to kind of click a button and say, well, I did my thing and I made a comment because public knowledge told me to, or library futures told me to, or this other organization that shall remain unnamed told me to. Um, how do you feel like, uh, quickly for you and Andrea, like, how do you feel like sort of the um, ways in which trust and saying versus doing and, and sort of this like, quote unquote, slack that we don't like, but slack that we don't of thinking about things plays into this um, when it comes to public uh, comment. Thank you. So I think that one of the first cuts on your excellent question is uh, to determine which comments are from actual humans and which comments are potentially driven by some of the dynamics, for example, that Michael was mentioning where uh, people's identities were impersonated and stolen. And so that uh, identification of uh, a security problem in essence would be the first cut that I think uh, is something in, that in any context we can uh, engage with. Um, after, uh, 
that first cut on the security issues, um, at that point, um, uh, and I have to be a little restrained here, but uh, I, I think looking at the question of whether content is um, offensive, problematic, et cetera, which is the ideas, that's a different bucket than the question of whether there are um, problematic things from um, the standpoint of, uh, for example, are there malicious links in the content? Are there ways to disrupt and damage the content, the, the comment process through the content itself? Um, so that, that's, that's one cut. Uh, um, I'm very protective of the First Amendment. I think you know people deserve to have a, a voice. So I'm a fan of hearing from all parties. Um, uh, and I should probably cabin my comments there. I'm happy to talk more when I'm not constrained. Let me just add in some thoughts. Because um, I, I wasn't familiar with who you quoted, but when you talk about online activism, um, I would differentiate between, say, hashtag activism, you know, the, hey, everybody tweet about this today, sort of activism versus agency commenting, or even contacting your elected official, uh, because uh, the, the first one, a tweet is speech, but not really action. When there are structures set up, when we as a society set up structures to facilitate the public's opinion being shared with their elected representatives or the agencies that our elected representatives on our behalf created uh, to craft policy, that's much closer to action in my mind. Um, and it's what makes it so important. It's what makes what happened to you so important and why you know, I started out by saying that uh, you know, uh, misappropriated comments, those sorts of things are serious and, and we need to find tools to make sure that we weed those out and identify them. Um, it's noteworthy that the FCC uh, at times has fined companies uh, in some of the proceedings that Michael was talking about that don't get a lot of attention, but find them because they gave false information uh, because it undermines the process and what the process was created for. So I would just draw a distinction between some of those. I, 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 worked, I worked as a local elected official. I understand uh, the challenge of getting your opinions to elected officials. And, and uh, uh, so the more we can set up structures that facilitate that, I think it's, it's the onus is on the elected officials and, and us as their, uh, the people that they represent to uh, to value setting up those structures in ways that they are productive. Uh, you know, when I was on the local school board uh, and we took public comment on uh, a topic, we you know uh, those stories, the, the qualitative information that we collected, uh, you know, was always best used when we could cite to it in justifying our vote, whether you agree with us or disagree with us. You would know, oh, Chris voted this way because he put more weight in these arguments and these facts or these stories. Uh, and then you hold them accountable and that's why we have elections. Um, yeah, just to add a couple of maybe thoughts to that. So um, just to pick up on one of the points you raised is that I think very true is that many people are, are like kind of hungry for opportunities to participate. They're really interested um, beyond like voting once every you know year, maybe um, once every couple of years. And so one of the things I think we should really take a step to appreciate is the way that um, technology in the last you know, 20, 30 years has radically lowered the cost of mm -hmm. uh, becoming aware of what you know these agencies are up to. Um, used to have to like uh, you'd have to go to the law library to like read the federal register, which like nobody is going to do. Like occasionally, like a law student might do it, right? But um, and so you can just Google <laughs> what what the agency's up to. It's all on their website. There's all kinds of information that you can get your hands on. Uh, and then, you know, it's just a matter of clicking up, you know, writing up what you want to say and clicking it. So this is really amazing. And, um, and we should celebrate that, celebrate the, the fact that it is so much easier to participate in this in a potentially meaningful way in government decision making. Now, having been said, 
uh, one of the one of the things that's happened as a consequence of this is yes, we've lowered the co the, the cost, like the actual financial cost barrier of accessing information, um, but you know these rulemakings are still incredibly sophisticated that are happening at the federal level. So it's you know when we say anyone in theory can access the information, you need to know a lot. You have to have a lot of background knowledge. You have to have specific expertise. You know you, you usually have to have a graduate degree in something. Um, to make heads or tails of these things. And so that's like the new barrier to participation is um, in as much as if you want to participate in a really serious substantive way, you have to uh, essentially be an expert. Uh, now that's true at the federal level. I, I really like the shift of the conversation to state and local level because there's a lot more um, play there, I think, mm -hmm. for people to participate. And, you know, one of the, I, I would just say kind of a hope is that the same way that the federal government um, has adopted these tools to facilitate participation. You know, maybe that's something that over time can filter down to state and local governments. Um, because in a way, what for folks who aren't necessarily going to be kind of technocratic experts, really what's happening, I think, is that they're weighing in with values. They're saying, like, these are my values. I care a lot about climate change. I care about our democracy, right? Um, or I think you're crazy for caring about climate change. Or, you know, what are you worried about? Our democracy is great. Corporations should, you know, just tell us what to think. Um, and so, um, you know, whatever people's values are, right? But um, but they're looking for opportunities to express those. And then I think another thing that we've really not figured out, and and I think you have to look globally for um, examples of um, of alternatives here, is um, a process that's not merely about okay, we're going to accept comments and do something like with them, right? Like this kind of one directional thing, like the government puts out some information, says, okay, this is what we're thinking about doing. We will listen to you. We'll make a final decision. And that's kind of, that's the conversation, right? Because especially when we're talking about values, I think people are fundamentally interested in kind of communicating with each other. I think a lot could be had socially if people are communicating with each other. And so thinking about structures um, that are not, you know, structures of communication that are not just this kind of two-way conversation at best, um, but actually allow for more lateral communication on these matters of public concern would be really wonderful. And there are examples of that outside uh, outside the US. The one problem I will just note, um, because nothing's ever easy, is that it's much more time consuming, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be, it's going to matter, it's going to, that's going to affect who can participate as well. And so um, there are like, for example, in Taiwan, they've had public deliberative processes on things um, that have had more of these kind of lateral conversations, but um, you know, I can imagine that it's the case that that's going to be a self-selected group of people and so not broadly representative. So, you know, none of this stuff is easy. There's no really easy solutions, but I do, um, I do like the idea of um, more state and local experimentation. Um, it would be wonderful to see that. Maybe some federal money to provide uh, uh, grants for that kind of thing. I, I thought we were going to end on the inspiring note of it's fantastic that so many people want to be involved in democracy. But I think it is more appropriate that we end on the note, nothing is ever easy. And so, so with that, please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you all so much. We will, we will take a, uh, about a 15 minute break. We'll be back at 2.45 with fake goods and